Thank you for joining Community Planning Conversations today. Charlie Smith, who is on the Urbana City Council, is my guest today, and we're going to talk about issues pertaining to our communities, not just Urbana, but the neighbor of Champaign and probably a little bit of the county. Thank you for spending time with me in this conversation. Um, before we get too far into it, uh, besides being on the Urbana City Council, uh, you work at the university. What do you do there? I'm a computer systems network administrator, systems administrator, and sort of general computer guru for the Department of Crop Sciences. Okay, that's quite different than being a citizen planner oh, it's, it's, on the it's, Urbana City it's Council. It's a completely different experience. Uh, it's night and day. One is, you know, totally technical, and the other is, uh, you know, more a social involvement. And uh, so what prompted this interest in uh, city government and making those kind of decisions? You know, I, I, uh, it, I've tried to figure that out for a long time. I, I've been politically active since my, since my early teens, uh, politically aware. I was an anti-war protester of the Vietnam War when I was 15. And my father was in Vietnam at the time. So um, I've, I've just been interested in government and, and had a couple of good teachers in high school that encouraged that interest. And when I was 19, I ran for school board. Uh, didn't win, of course, but uh, it, it got me going. School and board here? No, school board in, uh, in, in one of the Kansas City suburbs where I had gone to high school. Okay. And then uh, during college, I got involved in College Democrats, uh, the equivalent there. And uh, when I hit graduate school, I sort of dropped out of politics. I was too busy trying to get my degrees and that sort of thing, and then moved to... Um, you know, started raising a family, and uh, in 1989, the uh, chair of the Democratic Party was calling around looking for a candidate to run for city council, and uh, a neighbor put my name up, saying, oh, here, here's a guy who has a political opinion on everything, and uh, <laughs> he made me put my money where my mouth was, you know. So anyway, so I ran for city council in 1989. I did a four-year term, then got very involved with uh, raising two boys okay. and decided that, that uh, I needed to put my time into that. I couldn't do a job, help raise two kids in a two-career family, and, and try to do city council. So I took a 12-year hiatus. Um, opportunity came up again. My kids are in college and then some, and uh, so here I am back again. So the previous time on a city council was also in Urbana. Yes, yeah. It was uh, a slightly different ward at the time, but uh, um, it had a big university component as well. And uh, aren't you involved at one time and maybe still in one of the neighborhood associations? Oh, I, I, I am a little bit involved in the West Urbana Neighborhood Association. I've, I've kept, you know, sort of a membership there as, as being somebody who lives in the neighborhood. But I also uh, have been on the uh, library board for a long time, the Urbana Free Library Board. I'm, okay. I'm finishing up my seventh year of that. I've done, I did like 10 or 12 years of soccer uh, with the Park District, and so I've, I've had a hand involved in, in the community for some time. You certainly have. Well, um, now that you're on the City Council, I'm uh, aware of several issues that you uh, are deeply involved with. Um, first one that comes to mind, unfortunately, uh, came about due to a dreadful bicycle accident, and um, it has to do with the use of cell phones. What is happening with that? Well, as somebody who works with technology day in and day out, I'm, I'm pretty aware of what goes on uh, with, with, the, with the different techniques and, and the different studies. And um, I just don't understand how people can think that they can drive and handle a, a complicated piece of technology at the same time. Uh, they're trying to drive and deal with something that is totally distracting. Try, trying to deal, you know, dial your cell phone, talk on a cell phone, talk to somebody, somebody else, somewhere else, totally takes you out of the vehicle, and you're putting everybody at risk. I feel very strongly that way. And uh, uh, Matt's death hit close to home because he is the the uh, classmate of my older son, uh, and okay. they've known each other for nine or ten years, uh, going through high school together and then college. 
it could have been anybody, any bicyclist, any pedestrian, any person in a car parked on the side of the road. It's not, it's not just bicyclists. It's not just pedestrians. It's all of us are at risk when people are uh, yakking away on a cell phone in a car. Uh, and the studies show that you're at least four times at, at greater risk of an accident while talking on a cell phone uh, than not. Uh, if you're reaching for a cell phone or you're reaching for something in your car, you, you're like at nine times the, the risk of having an accident. So people need to take into account that, that uh, being distracted in a car is a disservice to everybody else. And I'd like to see it basically banned at the state level. And I will push at the county, at the local level, uh, to to achieve some uh, some kind of a ban. And it's not just hands free. It's it it, it doesn't matter whether you're hands free or, or talking on the phone directly. Your the level of distraction is the same. The studies are there. The studies, you know, every study that comes out comes to about the same kind of conclusion. There are three general studies all show about the same thing, and uh, one's a simulation, and there are two that are live. Uh, one out of Virginia, one out of uh, Australia. And the Australian one is very interesting because it, it looks at accidents and emergency room visits and, and boom, you know, just the correlation is right there. It is. It's the cognitive aspect of the situation. Yeah. You, you can't talk to somebody that's not in the car without being just totally distracted. You're, you're simply not there completely. And when you're driving a car, especially at high speeds, well, at any speed, it doesn't matter. Uh, but at, at high speeds, of course, everything happens at a much faster rate. So and it's the same thing. It's real interesting because if you look at pedestrian accidents with cars, uh, you're more, much more likely to survive an accident at 25 miles an hour than at 35 miles an hour. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a, uh, basically an exponential increase in, mm -hmm. in your likelihood of death depending on how fast the car is moving that hits you. So uh, just imagine moving at 55 or 65 miles an hour when you hit something. And so, you know, that, so you, you, your, your likelihood of doing real damage increases exponentially as you, as, as you go up in speed. And, uh, you know, when you're moving 60 miles an hour, you're moving at 88 feet per second. And I don't know that people realize that that's how fast they're moving. And, and the reaction time to, yeah, you know, to you, adjust for yeah, anything. it takes a couple seconds to adjust and you're 150, 300 feet down the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it, it's dangerous. So the local group, mattslaw.org, has both a local and a state component. At the state level, they're Okay, pushing, why don't you say that okay. website again? Mattslaw.org. Okay. They're, they're, they're getting organized. They're working with Julie Reitz locally. They're working with uh, a number of state legislators. And Julie Reitz is? Our local state's attorney, attorney. Who, uh, who found herself in a position of not being able to prosecute uh, the person responsible for Matt's death in a way that she thought was appropriate because there are, we're one of 15 states that don't have a law on um, distracted driving or um, basically uh, a, a, an involuntary manslaughter type situation uh, that, that fits this particular incident. This is if she had been drunk, you know, she could have thrown the book at her. Right. Okay. And so this is a key piece of information for people to understand about this situation. Uh, absolutely. That yeah. we're lacking this right. law within our state. Right. And so okay. there's, there's a number of different laws being pushed, and, and it'll be interesting to see how they come together. But, uh, you know, hopefully that there'll be something on distracted driving in the near future. And uh, hopefully uh, I'd like to see it go further. I'd like to see people just simply not use cell phones in cars and... And uh, all right, drivers not use cell phones. I mean, it's very easy. If you've got a passenger in the car, they can answer your cell phone for you. Right. You know? or, uh, or you can pull over yourself. You can pull over yourself. I mm -hmm. find myself pulling over now or just simply not answering. That's what, that's what voicemail is for. We have the technology. Let voicemail handle it. You know, you can call them back in 10 minutes. Uh, indeed. And, and you've mentioned a couple of studies, but we don't even have to leave our own community because our Kramer... Well, that's who one is, of the three studies that I'm who referring to. Who is at to. Beckman yes. Institute yeah. has done a lot of work, and uh, so have the folks at the Transportation Institute at the University of Michigan. They were some of the right. first on the on the simulation side right. of it, and um, it, you just can't do that and not crash the car. Right. This is one of the key things. Um, are there certain contingents of the population that you're working with to help move this along? I think uh, I'm, I'm sort of sitting at the periphery of it. I, I don't have time to get involved in every, in every 
every good group that comes along. There are way okay. too many of them that I would would, would be involved. I've got to have a I've got a full time <laughs> job that actually is probably more than forty hours a week as it is, and uh, and then uh, and then I have uh, the city council is is easily a ten to twenty hour a week job, plus I'm on the library board, and so okay. I've got plenty of commitments. But I, I do support their efforts, and I've got a piece of legislation that I've drafted that that I'd like to see. Uh, put in place, it would be really great if you could get it across both, you know, on, on both sides of the city line, divide, city li divide and uh, uh, I'll, 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 I'd hope to see that happen. So if people are interested in this, if they go to the website, they'll, they'll find contact, they'll find contact, contact information, people. Contact okay. people, And there's a petition to sign, and, All right. and so there's a petition you can download and start passing around. Okay. And so the next big thing, the next big effort there will be to pass around a petition. I think the and uh, the uh, Smoke Free Alliance did a great job of of organizing at the grassroots, and I think uh, a very similar effort could be made with cell phones. Okay, so. it sounds like it's uh, in uh, good hands to help move that along. Uh, we have a, another um, aspect. It's not quite on your side of the the line. It's more a decision in the uh, House of Champagne, and it has to do with ethanol. Um, plants. However, it does use the same source of water that services actually the whole county and even beyond our own own county. Uh, are there thoughts on the, the Urbana side about the ethanol plant? I'm, I'm very concerned about the use of water in general and we go through you know 20 to 30 million gallons a day in the Champaign-Urbana area alone. It I think people forget that water is not irreplaceable in the sense that we're taking it out of an aquifer that's probably 40,000 years old. So when we take uh, that straight water, you know, that, that, that fossil water basically, and use it to make ethanol, it, it's gone. And it one ethanol plant may consume basically 10% of the remaining uh, remaining um, what's the, there's a word for the capacity of the aquifer that I'm looking for here anyway it uses about 10% of the remaining uh, capacity of the aquifer and that's you know if, if Champagne and Urbana are growing at one or two percent a year that means that uh, the 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 capacity of the aquifer is going to be reached a lot sooner and if we end up with three ethanol plants in this area all using the same aquifer I, I've got a, a great deal of concern so at the same time that we're using 20 or 30 million gallons a day of, of water we're discharging that water out of our waste treatment plants into other aquifers we're, we're sending that water into uh, tributaries of rivers that feed the southern part of the state and don't actually recharge our own aquifer. We should actually be looking at a regional approach to water and, and the control of that water. Uh, that's what I'll be pushing for at the at city council. We actually are gonna be talking about it next Monday. Uh, so my big concern is getting a regional handle on the use of our water and on developing ways of recharging the Muhammad aquifer. It may be as simple as, as taking the wastewater that we use, that we discharge now, that goes south and, and sending it north, or sending it uh, north and west, uh, because it turns out the Sangamon River actually has a connection to the uh, Muhammad Aquifer via another aquifer, and if we dump, it, it may be as simple as dumping the water in the Muhammad Aquifer, and that in turn ac actually lets us recharge the Muhammad Aquifer. And so uh, the other thing, of course, is that uh, for a few pennies more per gallon, we could be treating the water out of the water wa wastewater plant and sending it to these ethanol plants, or sending it to places that could use it for an industrial use. So it'd be far better if we were we were we're, we're requiring. And I wish you know Champagne had an opportunity; they could have required that the ethanol plant that that the Andersons wants to build use wastewater, treated wastewater. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's only four or five miles up the road from the wastewater plant on that side of the community. I think it'd be far, a far better investment, much more long-term thinking, 
And that's what the issue is here. Being, people are being very short-sighted. You know, here's the water, let's just take it out of the ground without thinking about the long-term consequences. The long-term consequences are we're going to lose 10% of our water once that plant comes online. And we could be using that, we could, we could be sending them waste treatment water and getting, basically recycling water uh, in, in a much more, uh, much more uh, ecologically friendly way. Uh, so I'll be looking for that kind of thing. And I think that's the kind of approach that we need to be thinking about in the next 10 to 20 years uh, for our community. Otherwise, we're, you know, our, one of our greatest assets is water. You know, we've got an abundance of water now, but it isn't, fine. It isn't infinite. It is finite, and we'll know that better as we, un as we um, get more studies of the Mohammed Aquifer. Uh, but bringing three ethanol plants online uh, just from a water point of view, not even considering the, the impact on corn and food and, and even the environmental consequences of, of ethanol from corn, uh, uh, leave me very concerned. Um, and again, we have such expertise at the Illinois Water Survey that tells us everything that you have just uh, elaborated uh, that we don't seem to be capturing this in our decision-making process, that we're the driver to an economic development seems to be extremely strong. Yeah, well, it seems that, that, that the local governments get beat over the head by developers and, and the business interests uh, in a very short-sighted way. You know, basically, you do anything that has uh, a long-term view towards it, and you're, you're labeled anti-business. And uh, the anti-business, uh, anti-development uh, uh, hammer is brought out all the time. Anytime you try to do something, to me, is progressive and makes ecological sense. We have a very well-established recycling program in Urbana, but it, it's flat at this point. Um, I'd like to see it expanded, for example. I, there are ways of expanding it and making it better. Champagne doesn't have an effective program. I, I'd like to see their numbers. You know, I never see recycling bins out on the curb in, in Champaign. And, um, you, know, do, you know, we've got apartment recycling in, in Urbana. I don't see anything like that in Champaign. And, um, you know, there, there's a very big difference. There's a difference in some of the ways that the city government works. And, um, you know, so, so, you know, every time Urbana tries to do something a little progressive, if Champaign doesn't come along too, we're, you know, we're labeled anti-business or anti-development when that is simply not the case. We've got plenty of development going on and there's plenty of good ways of doing development in an ecologically friendly way. And people need to re realize that we have no choice anymore. You know, we can't use, you know, uh, a, a significant proportion of the resources of the world to take care of 1% of the world's population. Uh, we really have to to get a handle on, on the amount of uh, resources that we use as a country, uh, and it begins at the individual level. You know, there are lots of things that, that you can do as an individual to to uh, to recycle, to to use resources wisely, and so on. And water is is one very good example of that. You know, we don't think about it. It just comes out the tap. It tastes great. Uh, but uh, why does it taste great? Because it's forty thousand years old. Right, right, right. And the folks over at the water survey. I uh, have expressed great concern about uh, the water supply throughout the state. So it's, it, you're, you're, you certainly are in agreement with what uh, is coming out with the science. But you lead me to two other points that uh, um, it just happens to be because I've heard two lectures uh, this week. One was by John Sorkin, an architect, who um, I was talking about the uh, our human footprint on the on the earth, and this relates back to what you're talking about and um, our use of uh, the natural supplies, and that it takes four Earths, the equivalent of four Earths, to maintain the way we in the United States tend to consume. That's quite a figure. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm not surprised. There are all kinds of figures out there on, on, on the, the number of resources that we use. And as, as you know, and, and as the world becomes more developed, you know, other countries are developing. China's making all the same mistakes we made at a much faster pace. You know, they've got huge pollution pro issues. Um, 
their rivers are, are in terrible shape in a number of locations and they're trying to industrialize in you know a few years what, what we've done in a hundred years but all those people are, are you know coming on coming on and expecting to consume and have the same kinds of same standard of living that we have today and to do that uh, we're gonna have to figure out a much better way of using resources you've got India that has an even bigger population than China uh, also uh, developing uh, Africa is has been totally ignored by the world uh, by the rest of the world um, uh, with tremendous issues of poverty and and uh, illness that that uh, that uh, that really need to be addressed, and but eventually, I think each of these places will be addressed, and as and 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 the standard of living is going to increase across the world, and we have a finite number of resources. We got to figure out how to share them. Uh, uh, the costs are going to go up for 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 any particular item, and we can see that in oil. You know, the countries that are sitting over oil supplies are in the driver's seat. You know, the capacity of oil in the United States is is decreasing. And um, it's going to run out before the oil runs out in Venezuela and Saudi Arabia and Iraq, Iran. Uh, Russia controls a huge, uh, a huge number of oil resources. Uh, so, uh, so figuring out a way to move away from oil um, will be to this country's benefit. Uh, whether ethanol is the answer in, or to that or not, I don't know. Uh, maybe some forms of ethanol, uh, definitely some forms of biodiesel are probably very doable uh, economically and, and uh, ecologically. Our, the viewers will think this is a, a, a setup, but really isn't, uh, because just before I came to this uh, taping today, I was at a lecture uh, by John Todd, who is an architecture professor at the University of Vermont, and he talks about some uh, a, a city in China. You were just alluding to what is happening in China that is an instant city, huge, city and they are uh, dumping raw sewage waste right into their rivers and he and his students went over there and designed a ecological way of cleaning that river and from that ecological way of cleaning the river now they have turned this river into a way of a uh, producing a fish farm so it's now a piece of economic development within the community. So this leads me to ask this question of somebody on the Urbana City Council, and that is, how, how, how can thinking be moved uh, so that they view economic development and uh, ecology in the same framework, rather than thinking we have to put in a coal-producing plant, but instead we could go clean that sewage that you were talking about and that dirty water for the ethanol plants by uh, developing ecological businesses that could be turned into producing um, food, fish farms. Yeah, it, it's, it's very hard to try to sell these things. Uh, we, have a, we have a lot of progressive ideas. Um, it's very hard to do them at our scale because we're a smaller community it, it's a lot easier to try these things say in Chicago where where you can put together a pilot program and show that it works uh, without a huge hit on your budget if we wanted to you know I, I've been interested in trying to do a, a green roof on one of the city buildings uh, but again it's very hard to come up with uh, the, the, uh, the resources to do that when you know, we have one city building or two city buildings. You know, Chicago has lots of buildings to, to, to choose from. They have lots of roofs that they have to repair anyway. So, you know, in, in terms of uh, proving that some of these things work, it might be easier in a, in a bigger city. But we should be turning to places like Portland, Oregon, that have, uh, uh, have done a great uh, deal of uh, redevelopment, infill development, uh, in ecologically sound ways, they've got a, a metro view of of the commun of the of the area, and at that metro view, they have great recycling programs. They have uh, great mass transit. Uh, they've they've done a lot of uh, redevelopment of older communities, and I'm ho I'm hoping to get out there this summer uh, to take a look. But uh, there are clearly demonstrated ways of integrating ecologically sound principles into the way you do business. 
Uh, and I think it's a, you know, a matter of education and in some senses just simply requiring it. I know that in the uh, plan unit development ordinance that we're going to hopefully deal with this coming Monday and next week, hopefully will be final, we include uh, aspects of an encouragement of uh, ecologically sound ways of doing development as part of uh, the planning process, part of the, the development application. Is it going to be carbon neutral? Uh, not necessarily carbon neutral. There's, there's references to lead standards and so on and, and language that encourages trying things that are ecologically more sensitive or... Uh, and for the reuse of buildings? Um, I don't know the... I have to go back and look at... The, the document is very thick. It's uh, very <laughs> thick and uh, I haven't made... Well, it I mentioned that because that, you don't get any lead credit for reusing buildings and that's one of the yeah, weak well, aspects of lead. Actually, one of the things... Yeah, it, it, that's what I say. I wasn't going to go in there really so, so much. It's not so much that whether a building is LEED certified, it's whether the aspects of, and there's language in, in the document that encourages trying things that are ecologically more appropriate. Mm. And so we'll be looking at it uh, in a slightly different way than, than say, you know, just whether it has LEED certification. I also understand that LEEDs, the whole LEEDs certification thing is being looked at too in light of these sorts of things. Yes, they're, it they're, is. They're, they're, they're working on their standards. That's correct. And so uh, to me, uh, anytime you can reuse a, 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 a solid building, uh, you're, you're, it's not just that you're, 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 you're keeping a, a piece of history for one thing. And you look at Europe where you've got 400, 500 year old buildings that are still in use today. You know, that shows you that if you build them right you, and you take care of them, you can still be using them today. Uh, you can go back and do retrofitting as, uh, for, uh, uh, energy efficiency and so on, I think that's something we need to do. We need to have some flexibility in some of the historical preservation aspects. You know, uh, I think energy efficiency uh, trumps uh, whether your window is exactly the way it was, you know, 100 years ago, for example. Uh, so to me, it's, it's yeah, I, would, I would err on the side of, of trying to get energy efficiency before having something being totally perfectly historically accurate. But uh, I'd li still like, you know, you can, you can take a building. I, I think uh, one of the best examples I can think of a wonderful building uh, is on campus, Harker Hall, uh, where, where the, uh, uh, the foundation is located. Uh, they gutted that building uh, and uh, rebuilt it from the inside out. And it's, it's a wonderful old building, and yet uh, it's wonderfully modern on the inside. Beautiful woodwork. Um, and uh, they re retained a lot of the nice features of, of the building. So you can take an old building and, and do a lot with it. And at the same time, you're keeping all that old building material out of the landfill, which is one of the things that's, that I'd love to do. You know, buildings get torn down all the time. Uh, we really need a better way of, of recycling that material. Uh, it's very tricky uh, trying to find the space to do, to do construction, demolition, um, uh, recycling. But we are, you know, we do have some very big operations on the north side of town doing uh, asphalt and concrete recycling. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's quite doable. You just have to separate it out and uh, if we can find a, f figure out a better way of using, say, some of the wood that comes out of these things. The metal is easy to, you know, if you pull it out, you can recycle the metal. That's, uh, that's uh, fairly straightforward, I think, at this point. So uh, with a little care, a little forethought, uh, even, even when you do have to take down a building, you can at least recycle the components of the building. There are a couple of things that you've mentioned. Uh, just quickly, back to Portland. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is a large city, but you don't necessarily need a lot of roof space. Um, when I was in Portland, I did notice a youth hostel that has a green roof. So this can be done with any size, size roof. And, and to remind our viewers, we do have PACA, in the community that does uh, recycle building materials. And for those of you who have seen the program on the Straw Bale House or haven't, it will be shown on Saturdays at 5. And in that house, they salvaged a lot of the do or doors from mm -hmm. Harker Hall. So here, if you're right. right. Yeah. Here is a place where they reused yes. a lot uh, of those I materials. Should, should, you know, again, you know, it's, it's uh, a lot of the stuff is just needs to be, you know, you take it out, you give it a little sanding, a uh, um, um, little uh, varnish, and uh, 
uh, oil it up and and it's back in business and and I just all you have to do is look at, at some of the buildings that have been around four or five hundred years and um, they're still in use today and there's no reason we can't take a little better a little better care of our buildings of course the other, the flip side of that is, is that you know they they're built right to begin with and we build you know houses out of two by fours today you know basically we're building them out of toothpicks instead of building them out of Okay, so is that going to be included in uh, this ordinance that these places are built for a 40, 50, 60 year lifetime uh, rather than what is, yeah, it's not, what not is not the case 40, now? 50. I mean, you know, to me, uh, uh, institutional quality buildings are buildings that are expected to last 100, 150 years. But that's not uh, the way, if, if, when things are designed now, they're designed for a 10 year lifetime or right, a 20 yeah. year lifetime. and, and uh, communities are not coming to the table with this kind of requirement. Yeah. What will be interesting is to see what the university requires for Orchard Downs, which is probably a good example. If that were all city, it would be under this planned unit, develop, planned unit development type ordinance. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, But it's going to be done at the university level, so they'll be able to, you know, they'll be running the show. But it's a good example of what could be done with, uh, with this kind of ordinance where, you, where you're going to mix business, uh, residential, uh, and some commercial all in the same location. Uh, essentially, uh, in some ways, they've got a theme for, for the area or different themes within, within the 160 acres that they'll be developing. And uh, there's a lot of opportunity there to do institutional quality building. And, um, you know, when, when, you, when you look at the, the buildings that are done on campus, I, I, I watched the construction of uh, Christopher Hall, and it's got, you know, a solid metal structure on the inside, uh, real brick, not brick facade. It's got real brick in. You in, mean facing? It's got brick facing. facing. It's got. Uh, you know, but it's, it's, it's it's built of brick rather than brick facing right, put yes, on yeah, cinder there's blocks. Some, yeah, right? you know, there's 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 some, you know, it's not probably not you know it's not built out of limestone blocks you know put into place like uh, like. Uh, the Urbana Library. Well, the Urbana Library there, the limestone is is, is really a facing. On the it's old building? Of, yeah, on the old, on the yeah, on all of it. It's it's. Uh, I thought on the old yeah, building it was uh, blocks. It's okay. a lot of it's cement. Hmm. Okay, so with with uh, limestone over it, uh, it's actually the same limestone that it's from the same quarry as the original building too, oh. though, as well. So and the limestone blocks are pretty thick. So I mean they're they're, they're solid. pretty pretty massive. So yeah, I'm not sure you consider that facing or really part of the structure. It's, it's a fairly solid building. And uh, the idea, you know, you, you can in fact build buildings today that are institutional quality. And uh, there, there are several that have gone up on campus that, that show that you can do that. Well, you've opened up the topic of uh, Orchard Downs now, and it's on uh, the Urbana side of, of Wright Street, uh, though it is a university property. Will the city of Urbana have many opportunities for input on what occurs there. I'm I'm hoping that that by having you know some of our people, some of some of the some of the city planners and city staff are at the table talking and providing some advice to mm -hmm. to the, the university. Clearly, it's a university project, uh, and and they're calling the shots, but it has a great it's going to have a great deal of impact on the city of Urbana. I mean, it's it's 160 acres developed basically, you know, right at you know almost in the center of of uh, of uh, an older part of the, you know it's it's I, I should say it's, it's adjacent to two major neighborhoods in Urbana. Uh, the and southeast and cross streets. Right, it's southeast Urbana neighborhood. You've got the west Urbana neighborhood to the north of it, uh, and uh, it it in a way serves as a bridge to both of those neighborhoods. It, uh, it, and at the same time, you know, I'm hoping that they keep the, the uh, graduate student population that's been there as well, because I think that's part of the character of that neighborhood. They can, and, if, and if they do it right, they can, they can take some of the best features of Orchard Downs as they exist today and, uh, and uh, increase its potential. You know, if it really does become a lifelong living uh, lifelong learning center, which is one of the one of the themes that they're 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 working on, uh, that will be attractive to a lot of professionals in this community. 
especially a lot of older professionals that are that are interested in uh, changing careers or just staying active. I know that I know a number of people who are you know retirement or near retirement who find that kind of living very attractive. Uh, the idea of being able to stay intellectually stimulated uh, and uh, uh, but at the same time being able to uh, shut your door and go on vacation for six weeks or travel for three months and not have to worry about you know the place you left behind is is uh, something that uh, they look forward to. But you've just defined a certain economic level. Is that going to be exclusively? Well, no, that's that's had. one aspect of it. I said there were multiple aspects of okay. it here. I see, I see, you know, I'm hoping that they also keep the graduate student community because you know this is a chance to do a mixed um, development mm -hmm. uh, and. It, we really, we do too much uniformity in our country. We build a suburb that's, you know, all one, kind, one style of house and, and, and we don't put any business there. We make, make, make you drive to your business, you know, if you want to go shop somewhere, you got to go, go a mile or two or three miles away. Things are, you know, very separated and insular. And uh, yet, you know, you look at an example like Portland or whatever, where they're trying to do integrated, mm -hmm. um, Communities, a mix of residential, commercial, and uh, and uh, uh, business, and uh, and it's very doable. You know that was how cities and the and, and parts of cities have been for for years and years. You know you could step out your door, walk down the street, and buy a loaf of bread. Um, and uh, I think a lot of people are finding that you know find that kind of living attractive once again. And, and again, again, it, it's it's ecologically more friendly to be able to live in a walkable, bikeable community where you can get things that you need for yourself and for a living without having to get in a car and drive three or five miles to go get them. You know, I know that it's 3.4 miles from my house to the edge of, of, of Urbana. So if I need to go shopping East in or West Edge? East, East Urbana. Okay. Because I live, I live in the West Urbana neighborhood. Okay. At the edge of it, in fact, mm -hmm. I live, you know, two blocks from the campus. Uh, so for me to go shopping at the at the newly developing uh, stores at the east side of town, I've got to go 3.4 miles, and I can do it by bike. But you know, when it's cold and it's raining, it's not so attractive. If if I had to go six blocks, it's a lot easier, even if it's cold and and so on. You know, as it is when it snowed the other day. Um, it was actually not that hard to go to Schnooks by foot. I went shop. I went shopping uh, on Wednesday the 14th in the afternoon uh, by foot. But I'm aim I'm able-bodied. Um, You're talking about the Schnooks on Pilo. Uh, uh, no, I went to the Schnooks on in in downtown basically. You know, there's a Schnooks on on uh, South Vine. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. On South Vine, and uh, by using uh, two back streets, you know, it's basically California and Urbana, and it could be could have been Oregon. It could Illinois, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's this two non-main streets. I was able to walk there in the street because the sidewalks were, were still pretty pretty much full of snow, uh, but the snow plows had been through, so there's you know an inch or two of snow on the ground. It was a it was a you know a 20 minute walk, but it's not not hard. You know, it used to be that people thought nothing of walking multiple miles uh, to to run their errands, and now we complain if we have to go more than a mile. You know, people don't even think about walking half a mile. And yet, um, uh, we need the exercise. We've seemed to have reversed uh, the efficient design pattern instead of having all of these services in the hub so there's more of an equal distance for everybody to get to them. We in both of our communities have put everything on the perimeter. And so getting to all of these uh, places on the perimeter, since we're on a grid pattern and we have no angle streets, it's quite a lot of distance to cover. Yeah, well, not quite because we have quite a bit going on in the downtown and downtown area. You look, you know, we have we have two supermarkets in the downtown area. We have uh, we have a, a drugstore uh, at Five Points. Uh, there are. Uh, some retail opportunities uh, both in downtown. I mean, one of the most popular shoe stores in the community is right in the middle of downtown Urbana. Um, and uh, so so there's quite a bit that you can do at the core of, core of the community. Uh, there are some things missing. You can't walk to the center of town to find a, 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 a hardware store, for example. 
or you know, a plumbing I, store. Hard, hard, you know, just hardware in general. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it used to be that Huey's existed. You know, 20 but years ago. But there used to be a plumbing store on Main Street. Ah, okay. I don't remember that one. Yes. You know, so, so yeah. you know, there there are some some important Where businesses missing. Where the courthouse missing. edition is. Uh, okay. But there used to be some, you know, <laughs> there's there's some core businesses that are missing in downtown in the downtown area. But you can go shopping for groceries. So and and you've got uh, you've got uh, uh, a a health food store or, or you know a natural food store plus two supermarkets in the downtown area to choose from. That's that's quite a bit. So for food, no problem. Uh, for for other things, uh, you know, drug stores, you've got uh, you've got a drug store within one of the supermarkets and a standalone drug store at another. So so that you're okay with too. But some of the other things, if you want to buy a TV or some kind of electronics, you've got exactly one choice in Urbana, and that's well, one choice plus what they've got at Farm and Fleet. You've got Farm and Fleet to the north, and you've got uh, Walmart to the east. Oh, but Farm and Fleet now okay. is very removed. Yeah. So that well, they're they're both at the edges of town. Right. You're right, you know. So, right. so at least uh, you know, uh, you know that that's one of the one of the issues. You know, some of the the consumer electronics or, or or clothing and so on you can't buy in the community, and that's a shame. And, and what is Urbana planning to do to increase connectivity over to the uh, uh, drugstore, which is a Walgreens in the Five Point area? That's a tough street to to cross and then you have all the development that is going to uh, begin to flourish over on the northwest corner of Five Points. Yeah, you've got, got development on both the northwest and northeast corners there and uh, but, uh, there are some... But walkability is... Right, is I know the, the, the next big step will be to, to I think the, the plan is to work on Broadway which gets you down to, to parts of that. And what I'm interested in is seeing we have a, a I'm glad you brought this up because one of the one of the topics of course <laughs> is bicycles and pedestrians and yes, how to it improve is. that. We haven't gotten and to that. We haven't gotten to that, but uh, so I'll just go there anyway. Um, we have a a uh, a um, bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee that is working on uh, bike routes and pedestrian access in our community. They've begun a study with a combination of local consultants and a, a state-level uh, consultant who is nationally known. Ed Barsati from uh, the uh, League of uh, Illinois Bicyclists mm -hmm. is going to be giving a hand. He's a, he's a, uh, a well-known uh, consultant in the area of uh, bicycle and pedestrian planning, and he's going to work with our local RPC staff, engineering staff, uh, to um, uh, develop some planning, some plans for the city of Urbana. Uh, already, we have some some uh, improvements planned for the campus area. Uh, Illinois, Oregon, uh, Goodwin are going to get uh, major facelifts, and bicycles and pedestrians are going to become are going to be part of that plan. So that work will begin this summer. And so just to re remind folks, Ed Barsati did a session at a planning institute a couple of years ago. Oh, okay. So we brought him to the community. And what was so interesting, when he came to the planning institute, he was in his bicycling clothes because he had driven down, because he lives in the northern part of the state, but had parked his car in a satellite area in Urbana, took his bike out of the car, and rode over to the yeah, campus good. because it's so difficult to to park on the campus, so he was practicing what he you know, uh, he the, talks about here. The the, uh, the the there was a there was a I don't know if it was a bicycle or pedestrian. Um, um, there, I think it was a bicycle activity in in Madison last summer, and I know a large contingent of bicyclists from the city of Chicago took their bikes onto the metro. Mm -hmm. up to the very northern end of the metro, and then they rode their bikes from there to Madison. Madison. Okay, so uh, that's how, you know, they could, they could do that in a reasonable way. So they had their bikes in Madison, which is, a, again, is a very bicycle-friendly bicycle community. Uh, a little bit of planning get, get, can get you, you know, just make things a lot better. You know, if your streets are just two feet wider, you can, you can uh, accommodate uh, 
what are known as complete streets. You know, you can, you can have a bicycle lane on the right side of the road, which when it snows, it's much easier to clear and actually, and it has the benefit of, you know, sidewalks take longer to, you know, if, if our priority is getting the streets cleared of snow so that emergency vehicles and, and cars can get there uh, and the sidewalks aren't being done, pedestrians are gonna be on the streets. And uh, if we have complete streets and the snow plows have come through and cleared the bike paths, uh, you've got a little bit more space for the pedestrians that are going to be on your streets anyway because it's safer to be on the streets uh, or you're going to be slipping and sliding. You know, today when everything is iced over, it was you were safer in the street as a pedestrian walking <laughs> yes. than you were trying to walk on these icy sidewalks. And so uh, even though the sidewalk is cleared, the street's been treated with salt and the ice is off of it. So... Uh, and even when it gets cold again, it, that helps that it situation. Refreeze, right, yeah. yeah. So, so you know, we've got to take that into account. And so, you know, pedestrians and bikes have got to be part of your transportation planning. And uh, in mass transit, you know, our, bike, our bus system can accommodate bicycles. I put my bike on the, on the bus all the time. And uh, because the bus doesn't go everywhere I want to go, and sometimes it's faster to throw the bike on the bus, right. or throw the bike on the bus, and, and get somewhere, though most of the time I can probably get there in the same amount of time as the bus. You know, I can bike across the community in 30 minutes and that's how long it takes me to get. If I want to go from my house to, to a, a place I go to every once in a while on the, on the uh, out by Duncan Road, I can get there faster on a bike than I can by bus. That's very true with our bus routes, yeah, indeed. You know, so, <laughs> you know, well, it's a 25 minute bike ride, it's a 30 minute, it's a 30 minute bus ride. Right. So how do you learn about all these aspects? Of, do you read a lot? Do you have oh, books that well, you no, suggest to uh, people? Oh, or? I, uh, I read a lot of magazine stuff, a lot of stuff on the web now. Uh, for those who know me, I don't go anywhere without a computer. Uh, most people have, you know, the little PDA when is or sitting cell right phone. here as yes, a reference. Right, yeah, yeah. In case I need it, it's there. Uh, to me, you know, I, I, I'm looking forward to the day where I can have the power of this kind of a computer uh, in, in your a, palm, <laughs> in a smaller, smaller footprint, but it's not y quite there yet. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, wearable computing is is probably the future. Uh, but uh, you know, and you, you have a nice big screen here if you need it. So, uh, you know, I, I have it there. Maybe it's a crutch here in, in case I need to look something up. Uh, that there is actually something we, we could have looked up if we wanted to talk about ethanol, but. Uh, uh, you know, it, to me, the, the, this is a wonderful resource. But again, you know, we're, pr we're, we're very privileged. Uh, I've got the economic ability to have a, a fairly nice laptop. This is my personal laptop. I use it for everything. Uh, and I drag it around with me like people drag their cell phones around. You know, clearly, you know, getting back to But you to this, don't use it I in your car. I don't use it in my car, yeah, you know. <laughs> or if I am using it in my car, I'm sitting in the back seat watching a DVD while somebody else is doing the driving, you know. Okay. I have known people who have tried to use a computer while driving, and that is nuts. So how often do you go and use the university library? Uh, I'm not, uh, I, I don't use the university library so much as I use the Urbana library. Okay. So I, I, it's easier for me to get to the Urbana Library, and as a board member of the Urbana Library, I, I like using that resource. Well, I was thinking of it in the sense of materials that would not be necessarily in the Urbana Library, such as some materials that are in the City Planning Library, the Landscape Architecture Library, that would oh, be yeah. very yeah, well, actually, useful. I, I need to learn a lot more about that. I'm much more technically oriented. I, my background is in biology, math, and statistics, uh, and computer science. Uh, that's my background, and uh, I, I'm slowly getting more and more. I've picked up some books on economics, uh, uh, you know, to try and understand economics a little better. Uh, I, I'm not as well read as I'd like to be, and as well educated on some of the planning issues. And I'm looking, you know, I, two years into this term on the council, we've got some major things uh, accomplished and under underway. And I'm looking at uh, at a next tier of materials that we can do things like bicycle plan, uh, bicycle activities. Uh, Bicycle-related planning, pedestrian-level planning. I'm probably going to try to attend a uh, an institute in Portland this summer. Uh, uh, regrettably, the the planning institute that's coming up here is right in the middle of right planning right institute. In, the first and second first of March. And second of March, plus sponsored the by the yeah. Department of Urban and Regional Planning. And that's right in the middle of uh, of two days of planned vacation I have because I have family coming in from out of town, and so uh, I had planned that long before the Planning Institute was uh, on my radar, which is very regrettable uh, because that's a, that's a great way to catch up and, and learn some of these issues. So I'm going to have to go 
uh, out of town to uh, to see some of this. But I did it. I, I've I've gone out of town to some of these things before. I've gotten great ideas that 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 you can turn around and how do you you know you see these things out of town and then you have to figure out how do they apply to your right. town. How can you you know you go out there you learn things and then you bring it back and and you work with the local people who know what who know what's available. I'm really very dependent on our planning staff uh, to who have an expertise in this area. Say you know here's my idea. Can you can it be done? You know, how can we how can we take something that works over here and 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 make it fit in in an Urbana way? And I think that's very important. And uh, uh, hopefully we can we can do more and more of that uh, uh, in the future, because uh, I think we'll, we will see. You know, there's a lot of pressure uh, for development. Uh, I think as resources, energy gets um, more expensive. Uh, people will realize that their the core community is where they really want to live. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to put some pressure on us to to come up with uh, a very livable city that is also walkable, and uh, and hopefully some things will return to the central parts of our central parts of our cities uh, as these things happen. I think I think there's an ebb and flow to this, and uh, uh, at the same time I also recognize that we have some of the most productive farmland in the world. I don't want to pave it over, so I'd much prefer to to see infill development and and a little higher concentration of things that if they can be done uh, efficiently and economically than, than developing out on the edge of town. I mean, these big mega malls go out to the edge of town because land is cheap. They put, you know, they pave over lots of parking uh, and, and they're done with it. Uh, you can't, you know, when you, when you try to re build something big in the middle of a city, it takes a lot more planning, a lot more uh, capital. So it's a little, little more difficult to do, but it's very doable uh, if you uh, if you really try, and uh, and if you take a long-term view towards these things, um, I think the economics will uh, pay off. Well, Charlie Smythe has left us with some terrific challenges uh, in this conversation. I'm going to leave him with one challenge, and that is, uh, why don't you start a a book club with your fellow council members or your planning commission members and read some of these books that will generate some of the conversations on these these issues. I leave you with that and we'll Thanks close so. with that. And remember, planning matters. Thank you very much.